Thank you, Patty. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Thank you so much for the offertory. Evangelist Rick Flanders has been a, a friend of our church for some time now. I think we originally made connections, made acquaintance with Brother Flanders probably through the ministry of the ranch, through the Bill Rice Ranch, while he was uh, still pastoring in, in Michigan. And since that time, he has stepped out into full-time itinerant work for the cause of, of revival. And he's been an encouragement to many folks. And in fact, he's an encouragement to me about every month because I read all of his articles and keep up with his, his news posts that he has on, online. Uh, but he's been a blessing to us, uh, his second visit now with us in our church. And we Amen. just want God to use uh, him and for us to open our hearts to the message that he certainly is going to bring us from God's Word. Brother Rick Flanders, come right ahead, please. Amen. Thanks so much again, Pastor. Uh, great to be here. Appreciate the privilege. Now let's find in our Bibles the book of John. Would you do that? It will be actually, literally, and figuratively on the same page tonight, and that'll be helpful during this time. Now, um, I want to suggest that all of us be here as much as we can be for the meetings. You know, whenever God's people get together for the purpose of seeking the face of the Lord, something's going to happen. And that all has to do with our hearts and seeking the face of the Lord. If the preaching was lousy... Uh, we could really see a revival in this church if we would seek his face. You know, it says again and again, seek me and you will. And that's a promise from the Lord, and we really need the Lord's help in about a hundred different ways in this good church. And I want you to just join us. Now, I'm aware that I'm in Florida. I had a preacher from Michigan who pastored in Florida for years who told me that Florida is Michigan's lower peninsula. That's a Michigan joke there because a lot of people who live in Florida are actually Michiganders transplanted to be retired down here. Now, I'm aware of that, so I'm going to go ahead and stretch it and urge you not only to be here in the evening services, but come for that 8 a.m. service that we have every day. And so you can get morning and evening uh, revival meetings. They won't be the same thing, and I just know you can do it. If you're retired. I know you can do that. Now, it's 810 actually over there, and I suspect uh, that what we're going to do is show up at 8, and there's, they're going to have coffee out there. Wink, wink. Okay, we're going to have coffee out there. Every senior citizen likes coffee. That's why we go to McDonald's, you know, for the senior coffee over there. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll drink coffee. That'll wake us up, and then we'll have the service in the morning. And then retired people can take a nap all day, right? Okay, and to be back at night. But even if you're not retired, if you just quit your job this week and uh, try to be here all week long, that would be a good thing. But making a joke out of all of that, uh, we will have something special here, I really believe. And uh, the Lord was working in our lives this morning and I think all afternoon and is helping us big time. Turn to John chapter 16, and while I'm still talking, one more thing to you folks. Well, it's wonderful to see that Pastor Don... Uh, Hershey wrote her to be with us today, and when I came from the airport yesterday, I didn't realize he'd actually be in our midst. What a blessing, and I'm thrilled with that. And, of course, family up here sitting up here with him. Well, God bless you, Don. This is just really, really great. And uh, what I was going to suggest to everybody here, uh, let me ask a question first, kind of a survey. Having been back in a while, I don't remember just exactly the atmosphere or the way people think at faith, but, okay, let me ask you this. How many of you folks would be really offended and put off if somebody got right up while I'm talking before the sermon and uh, walked closer to the front to get a better seat? I mean, they, uh, uh, you know, messed up the dignity of the service by getting right up while Brother Flanders is talking, went to the aisle and came up about three rows to get a better seat. How many of you would really be put off, offended, hurt, angry, or upset over somebody doing that? Would you raise your hand? Pastor, nobody would be bothered by that. This is a very informal, laid-back church. I'm glad to hear it. Now I got another question for you. How many of you folks way back there? Now I know there's always people way in the back who've got to be back there for important reasons. But how many of you folks way back there say, looking over the congregation, I see a better seat, a much better seat. Incidentally, a better seat is closer. How many of you folks would say, 
you know what? I see a seat that would be a lot better place from which to enjoy this service, and it's in front of me. Raise your hand. You're not cooperating. <laughs> But you got the hand. While I'm talking just another minute, if you want to, just get right up and walk up a few rows. See a big, broad smile on my face if you'll do that. Now, let's be praying also. Gathering, but let's be praying. And I may even call for some special prayer meetings. I was impressed in the right way with the prayer meeting I joined this morning with a group of men early. I'm impressed with what? Faith, boldness, and focus. A lot of Baptist prayer meetings are anything but focused. Uh, in other words, they're shotgun prayers about everything. You wouldn't know if any of the prayers got answered because nobody asked for anything. I'm not talking about that. We had a real, I think, spirit-led prayer meeting, and that makes things happen. Did you know prayer meetings in the Bible were for the purpose of getting things done? Not just to make us feel better, but he said, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. See, it's about changing things. And we'll have prayer meetings, I think, this week. Now we're looking at John chapter 16. Did I already say that? Go all the way down to verse 5, if you will. John 16, 5. This is Jesus talking. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, said Jesus, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, in those few words, the Lord Jesus Christ said, yes, I'm going away. That night, the night before he died on the cross, he was making clear to his disciples that this era of their experience was coming to a close because he was going away. And you know from chapter 14, their hearts were troubled. And here we read, they were sorrowful. But he said, you know, even though I'm going away, it is expedient for you that I go away. Now, this is a pretty bright congregation, so I'm not nervous about asking questions. He said expedient. That's not as unusual a term as importunity was in Sunday school. A lot of people know what that means, but why don't you tell me? He said, you know, I've been with you now for three and a half years, man, but you know what? It's expedient for you that I go away. What does expedient mean? Well, you're giving me good words. It's basically, it's better. He was saying, you know, I've been with you, 12 apostles, for three and a half years. In the boat, on the shore, teaching, walking, preaching, healing. You have heard things that men for centuries have longed to hear. You have seen things that very few eyes have ever seen. We've had a not wonderful three and a half years. Now I'm going away, but I want to tell you something, man. You ain't seen nothing yet that's in the Greek. It's expedient for you that I go away. Because when I go away, the New Testament era will begin. And one of the big things about that 
is that the comforter is going to come unto you. Down there in verse 13, we learn that the comforter is the spirit of truth. That's what he's also called in chapter 15 and verse 26. And chapter 14 and verse 26 makes it clear that we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Now look up here and help me with this. The Bible teaches that God exists. The creator of the universe exists and always has existed in three persons. One God, Father, Son, and Spirit. When Jesus Christ was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the miracle of the incarnation took place. It's an unspeakable miracle. God, second person of the Trinity, God the Son, became a man. Son of man, Son of God. But now, he's going back to the Father. Incidentally, he's still a man. Did you know that? Remember the place in the Bible where it says there's one God and one mediator between God and men? The man Christ Jesus? He still has the body he got in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But when he was going to go up there, and he did go up there, he was sending number three down to live inside us. And the Holy Ghost is not a feeling. He is not a power. He is a person, just like Jesus Christ. He comes to us as the comforter, and he will live inside believers, and the New Testament age will begin. That's what we're taught. Now look at verse 7, because some of this we have to be quite precise about. In verse 7 says, he will come unto you. Okay? And then it says at the end there, I will send him unto you. Unto who? Unto believers. The Holy Ghost, well, on the day of Pentecost, was be going to begin living inside believers. Our bodies were to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, when he said the Holy Spirit was coming, he didn't mean the Holy Spirit was coming into the world. God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is omnipresent. God is everywhere. The Holy Spirit is and always has been in the world. Before the flood came of Noah, it was said, my spirit shall not always strive with men. And way back before the flood of Noah, the spirit of God was striving with men. That's not what he was saying. He wasn't saying, when I go away, the Holy Spirit will come into the world. Oh, no. He was saying, the Holy Spirit will come into you. And it'll be a phenomenal change, not only for you, but for the world. For Deltona. For Florida. For North America. For the whole world. When the Holy Spirit comes to live inside believers. Why? Take a look at this, verse 8. You'll have to look at it because I want you to see this is just what he said. And when he has come, come where? Come into me. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now here's what he was saying. The Holy Spirit is going to live inside Christians. After the day of Pentecost, Anytime anyone who believes, anyone believes on Christ for their salvation, they'll be sealed with the Spirit. Right then, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you. And his main reason for living in us, or one of them is this, to reprove the unsaved. We are taught in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, that when Jesus would go away, he would leave us phenomenal blessings, wonderful blessings. He would give us the privilege of asking the Father for things in his name. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Fantastic privileges in prayer. Expectation for phenomenal answers to prayer. And then he said, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you. He'll be there to help you live the Christian life. 
He'll be there to manifest God to you. He'll be there to inform your mind so you can understand the Bible. He will give you my peace, my love, my joy. He will make you productive. You will bear much fruit. And a lot of this will happen when a sinner meets a Christian. Now by sinner, I mean an unrepentant sinner. This morning we learned everybody's a sinner. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But unrepentant sinners, those who are not redeemed and forgiven, those who don't belong to God as children, those who don't have the Holy Spirit in them, are affected when they meet a saint, when a sinner meets a saint. Now I've got to explain saint. Book of 1 Corinthians, other books in the New Testament say that every saved person is a saint. Did you know that? The word saint comes from a word that means someone set apart for God. That's me. That's you. If you are the poorest Christian at Faith Baptist Church today, if you're washed in the blood, you're a saint. Because by his blood, he has bought you. Lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> you're his. And that's what saint means. Just call me Saint Richard, okay? But no, you are a saint. Matter of fact, the way the Bible teaches is this. You are a saint, now live like it. You don't become a saint by the way you live. You are made a saint by the blood of Christ when you get saved. So now watch. Something ought to happen when a sinner meets a saint because inside the saint is the Holy Ghost who through the saint will reprove the sinner of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, you can talk back. When a sinner becomes aware of his need by the work of the Holy Spirit, we call that what? We have a name we use. They are under conviction. That's what we're reading about. What is that? When the Holy Spirit reproved me of my sin. All right, now, I had a conscience before I was a Christian. My conscience would tell me I've been wrong, I've done wrong, I do wrong. But you know what my conscience never did for me? My conscience never revealed to me that my greatest sin was not believing on Jesus Christ. But look at verse 9. Of sin because they believed not on me. This morning we learned how many kinds of sinners there are, that all men are sinners. But the biggest difference is are you a sinner who has repented or not? And that'll make the difference between heaven or hell for you. The Son of God bought your way into heaven. You can go to heaven no matter where you've gone or what you've done if you'll believe on him. The sinner's great sin is not to believe on Jesus Christ. But no way could I have figured out that without the Holy Ghost revealing it to me. Of righteousness, verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. Now, I had a sense in my mind uh, by the nature of God that was in me in the sense that I was made in the image of God, a sense of justice and righteousness, and I had it figured out pretty young that I would have to be deemed righteous to get into heaven. Of course. I would have to have a certain amount of righteousness. The question is how to get it. Through the sacraments, by doing more good than wrong, but I never in all the world, never in all the world, never in all the world dreamed that the righteousness that would get me to heaven wouldn't be mine, it would be his. Not things that I did, but things that he did for me. Died, rose again, went back to heaven. The Holy Ghost helped me to see that. And then it says, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged, a reference back to chapter 12. Okay, now watch. In chapter 12, just a few days before he went to the cross, the Lord Jesus publicly said this, now 
is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, shall draw all men unto me. And that lifting up is a reference to him dying on the cross. And I had a sense, and so do you, that there's a judgment coming, that the one who created me has a right to have a reckoning with me about the way I have lived. Okay, now watch. But never in all the world could I have come up myself with the idea that judgment day happened at Calvary. But it did. At Calvary, all the sins of mankind from Adam to the Antichrist were laid upon the Son of God, the Holy One of God, and he volunteered to take the punishment. And you know what, friends? I never could have understood that except the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. How did that happen? Through a Christian. An important part in the story of a lost soul is what he met the Christian, a witnessing Christian, where the Holy Ghost used that Christian in my life. And then what happens? Verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them. Now, who was there? The 12 apostles. He was promising them that the Holy Ghost, when he came, would guide them into all truth. Here's exactly what that means. He was saying, men, there are more things that my Father, I, and the Holy Ghost want to tell the world. But you're not ready. You already have the Old Testament scriptures, all of them, 39 books. I have been with you. But he said, there's more to come. And when I go away, the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit will guide you men into all truth, and he will teach you things to come. He said something about that in chapter 14. He says he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have spoken unto you. What is he talking about? The writing of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, on to Revelation. What do you mean? Okay, now, Matthew is there. He said, Matthew, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to teach you all things and bring to remembrance everything I said. Matthew probably didn't have a clue what he meant. But one day, Matthew, the old publican, took his pen, and the Holy Ghost dictated to him what we call the book of Matthew. Now, Brother Flanders, Matthew was there for most of those events. Didn't he go by his memory? How good is your memory? If I asked you to repeat what I preached about this morning, maybe you could because it was pretty simple. But what if I asked you to reproduce it word for word? Even if you thought hard about it. But Matthew did that. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. That was supernatural. Not only that, in the book of Matthew, you read places where he not only wrote down what he saw and heard after years, he wrote down what people were thinking. You know, it would be interesting, Pastor Hirsch and Roder, if I knew what these folks were thinking right now. I might be discouraged. I don't know. But haven't you read it? that when Jesus said this, they reasoned in their mind. Remember that? Now we read, he'll guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. That's the book of Revelation. Matthew to Revelation. All those books given to us through the apostles, many of them written by apostles, others of them written by men authorized as prophets by the apostles. There's the New Testament and look at verse 14. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. You know what that means? That's the purpose of the New Testament, to glorify Jesus Christ. Now look at this. A sinner bumps into a saint. I'm talking about a witnessing saint. Well, would you like to read something while we're waiting for the doctor? Sure. Then they get into a conversation, and it's not like any conversation he's ever had with anyone because there's a voice talking to his heart while the guy is talking to his ears. A Christian. I remember in our country church, 
we got to training children to witness to people. It came about when a guy named Jamie in the fifth grade walked up to me and he said, teenagers in this church go witnessing and soul winning. Why can't we kids? And I didn't come up with a good answer. So I started teaching them just how to give out tracts. And I would, we were in a nice neighborhood and I would watch them give out tracts. We did that for years, to be honest with you. One of the most remarkable experiences I had was there was a fellow with big troubles. And he said, I wonder if I could talk to you, Reverend Flanders. I think you maybe can help me. We sit down and talk. So the first thing I brought up was his salvation, him and Christ. And I explained it to him. Then he said, you know, I think I did that. I said, how and when did that happen? He said, I was down here on such and such street in Carroll. I was under the car working. And two guys, two little boys, two elementary school kids with ties on walked up to me and said, Mr. We want to give you something. It was one of those gospel leaflets. And then one of the kids said, Mr., if, you're gonna, if you die, when you die, or do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And I was thinking, could that kid tell me that? So I put him to the test, and he said, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. And you know what happened? That kid told me about Jesus Christ, told me about what you just told me. And you know what I did? I prayed with him and asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior sinner bumps into a saint he's reproved of sin righteousness and judgment to come and then you know what the Christian does opens the New Testament and now that he realizes that he is justly condemned as a sinner he comes to see in the Bible that there is hope and that hope is in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And it's not just doctrine years in church. It's not just words printed on a page. It's real to him. I remember talking to a woman who visited our church like some of you did today. I was at her home. The kids were around the table. I was explaining to her about Christ. And you know what? When I came to the part where he died for our sins, she reached across the table and she grabbed my arm. And with great emotion, she said, Pastor Flanders, nobody's ever told me this before. I'm talking about a seminal moment when the Bible comes alive and shows the sinner he needs Jesus Christ. And in a few moments, he's saying yes to Jesus and passing from death unto life. It's a big experience when a sinner meets a saint, which will happen tonight. Some of you will pump gas in your car. Some of you will buy eggs for breakfast tomorrow. Some of you will go home to someone who's not yet saved. A sinner will meet a saint. But I'm going to tell you something. Something phenomenal, one of the most important things that happens on the face of the earth any day can happen any time a sinner meets a saint. But it depends on three things. Dear Lord, speak to us now. Show us the truth about the Holy Ghost, about our own need of a Savior, and Lord, about abiding in Jesus. For we ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the times I was traveling in the last six years, my wife and I were on an airplane flying to Florida. Ever been to Florida? Yeah, okay, so... We were going to fly down to Miami. I sometimes preach at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, quite a unique church down there. Pastor Ryan Price and I had been there before, was looking forward to going back. We were getting on the plane, and I, being an expert flyer, was uh, consoling my wife, who noticed that our boarding passes gave us seats that were separated from each other. And my wife just can't bear to be separated from me. But you know what? I was C, she was A. I said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. So we got on the plane, we got the boarding passes, and there's a guy sitting there in that three-seat section. And I said, sir, I wonder if you would mind. I don't think you will. My wife and I don't mind if we have an aisle seat or a, a window seat. Doesn't matter to us. We just want to sit together for this final flight. And if you were willing to move, we could just do that. He said, I'm not going to sit here anyway. I said, what do you mean? He said, some family is in the back there, a whole big family. They really jumbled up their seats. 
and they're going to redo things they already told me. They're going to move me back there. Well, you can sit down now if you want. So we sat down. And then he got up. And he left. She was on the window end. I was in the middle. Had the seat on the aisle open. And a fellow came and he sat down in that seat, a very friendly fellow. And I had my Bible out. That's a pretty good thing to do. And I was going to start reading. I don't remember exactly how the conversation started, but I said, my name is Rick Flanders, and I'm headed to Miami. I'm going down there to preach. I'm a traveling preacher. And he said, oh, really? I said, is Miami, Miami home for you? He said, yeah, that's where I live. I said, well, good. I'm going to preach at the Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. You ever heard of it? He said, no, I've never heard of it, but I know where Fort Lauderdale is. So we got talking like that. And then he said this. He said, you know, I've been going to church for about three months. The name the church. Sounded to me like one of the contemporary churches, kind of a no name, no denomination, unusual name, you know, one of these kind of churches. And he says, I go to the such church. Been going there three or four months. I said, well, good for you. And he said, I see you're studying the Bible. I'm studying the Bible too. I said, well, good. And he said, I'm preparing to get baptized. I said, oh, really? What are you studying? And he gave me a little idea. Then I said, can I read you a little something that I'm reading today? The third chapter of John. Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I read the verses from the lips of Jesus. And I explained to him, Christ dying for our sins and our need of him as a savior. But we were being interrupted by uh, flight attendants, you know, and, and also the, they were explaining to us what to do if the plane crashes. Incidentally, folks, I know what to do if the plane crashes. Die. <laughs> but anyway, I've heard it a hundred times, and, and so we get interrupted and back and forth. And in part of the conversation, I give him a little track called Good News, one of the best tracks I've ever seen to explain how to be saved. There's one I got from Iowa, and I gave it to him. And then we were back, you know, from being interrupted, and I looked over there, and he was reading it. The first page, I wasn't bothering him now. The second page, the third, the fourth, he got to the end of it. I said, that's an interesting little article, isn't it? He said, it really is. I said, you know what? Your study of the Bible isn't really going to lead you first to baptism. You know what it's going to lead you to? He said, what? A decision. A decision you will have to make for or against Jesus Christ. He said, you mean this one? And Pastor Hirsch and wrote her, he read it word for, for word out of this track. It's a good description of the salvation. I said, that's the one. And I explained a little bit more about why and how. And then I just said, his name was Omar. I said, Omar, are you ready to make that decision? He said, I certainly am. I said, did you know that Jesus Christ would hear your prayer right on this plane if you call upon his name? He said, yes, he would. And he bowed his head, and I heard the beautiful music of that man calling on God like a little child, asking Jesus Christ to save his soul. He looked up, and I read more verses. Incidentally, I don't mind people listening in. That's not really a private conversation, folks. <laughs> and I explained again how he could be sure, and he was so glad. Incidentally, when we got off the plane... Pastor Price met me at the airport, and here comes Omar. Omar walks right, walks right up to him, and he says, so you're Pastor Price? He said, guess what? He said, I got saved on the plane. <laughs> he wasn't the least bit ashamed of it. But before that happened, we're sitting there, and he just got saved, and he's rejoicing. And then he says this. He said, you know what, Mr. Flanders? He said, I don't think it was a coincidence that I sat down next to you today. And neither do I. And he said, I'm so glad you did. Now, saints in this room are going to run into sinners tonight and tomorrow. And if we get deliberate about it, we will, uh, we will actually deliberately meet sinners. Okay, now watch. 
The thing, what happens when that happens depends on three things. And I know I'm a church attender too, not just a preacher. When a guy tells you how many points, I'm starting to click off the clock. Look, he's done the intro. This is going to be here till midnight. No, I, I know that. These are three simple things. But you need to listen now more than you ever did. What are they? Number one, the condition of the saint. Just any run-of-the-mill, carnal, backslidden, worldly saint will have no effect. The condition of the saint, number two, the choices of the sinner. Did you know an unsaved person has already made choices about God before you ever came on the scene? Did you know the final choice to trust in Jesus Christ is the final one in a long string of choices? Did you know that not all sinners are created equal? That's why. When Simon Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and preached the gospel, 3,000 repented. And when Stephen, also filled with the Holy Ghost, several chapters later, preached the same gospel, they murdered him. All sinners, all dead in trespasses and sins, but having made other choices. And number three, the communication of the scriptures. That New Testament I was talking about. Okay, no, number one. The condition of the saint. Now in John 13 through 17, the Lord Jesus is parting from them and telling them, I'm going to leave you everything you need. Everything you need to live the Christian life. Everything you need to be happy, peaceful, productive, successful. Everything you need to live a holy life. Everything you need to be a witness for me. When I give you the Holy Spirit, you're going to have everything you need. Now go home and read John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and have the Lord Jesus explain it all to you in his own words. But the bottom line is in chapter 15. Look at chapter 15 real quick here. I, Jesus said, am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus said. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, he said, ye can do nothing. Now if you keep reading, which I won't take time to do right now, it'll become clear to you that the fruit he's talking about us bearing is spiritual reproduction. Other people getting saved through my witness. Book of John 13 through 17 looks at the salvation of his soul from the angle of the believer and the angle of the sinner. This is from my angle. If I will do what he said, I will bring forth much fruit because it'll be his fruit. He will work through me, channels only. Blessed master, this song ought to be slowed down every time right here. But with all thy wondrous power flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Simple metaphor. I'm the vine. I have the sap. The life is in me. You're a branch. We're intimately connected. But you only bear fruit if you stay connected with me, if you abide in me. But if you do, the fruit will come. Other people will come into my family through your witness. Not about taking a personal evangelism course. Not about learning sales techniques, foot in the door, ask this question, that one, before they think about it, have them pray. 
No. No, he says, stay connected. Abide in me. And you will bear not just fruit, but much fruit. Now, the condition of the saint. Now, what condition do I need to be in? Abiding in him. Here I am, I'm going down to the store, going to pick up a loaf of bread and some milk for the wife if I lived here. And I go inside and something, I shouldn't say something, but someone points out the lady behind the counter. And I don't know where it comes from. But I say, are you having an all right day? You look a little down. And you know what, to my surprise, she shows some emotion. She said, I am not having a good day. And then, I don't have time to think about it. I just say, you know where I've been all day? No, I've been in church. You know what, I have problems like everybody else, but the thing that helps me the most is Jesus Christ in my life. Have you ever heard anybody talk like that? Yeah, once. My grandmother used to talk. And you know what? Here we are, a convenience store. And I'm telling her about Jesus Christ. It just flows. The condition of the saint. You know, a saint who is worldly, he lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life carnal. He just goes by the impulses of his flesh, doesn't know anything about the leading of the Spirit. He just tolerates church and does his duty and keeps the wife happy. He goes to that convenience store. That'll never happen. And if he opened his mouth out of duty and said, you know, the preacher preached about witnessing. I guess I have to give her a tract. Here, read this. Out he goes. No effect or very little. Right? The condition of the saint should be abiding in me. Now the Lord Jesus Christ said, here's how to get there. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Number one, get clean. Have you ever been in a predicament where you really should speak up for Christ, but there's sin between you and God? Sin you know about here, God is dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you, and you should have never said that to your wife. And you know, that was a sin, Flanders. That wasn't just a misspeaking. That wasn't just usual husband and wife problems. That was a sin. You need to confess it to me, and then you need to go home and ask for an apology. Well, no, I mean, uh, she was wrong and all that. And I think all this argument that I'm doing with God about my sin has to do with me, how I feel. And God must really need me that he keeps dealing with me about this. And, but it isn't about me, it's about them. About who I'm going to run into today. Have you ever been in a spot like that and you weren't ready? You were no way ready. No way ready. And no witness went out. And not only that, if you did witness, it would have no effect. Help me. How many of you know what I mean? Okay. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Now you go on and read abide in me, and here's what you'll find out. Abide in me is a way to live. And you know what it is? A life of go ongoing dependence on Christ and submission to Christ. Okay, let me just take a minute and explain that. He said, without me, ye can do very little. Remember that verse? He said, man, without you, you can't get much done. It's verse 5. Is that what it says? We've got a, a naysayer back there. What does it say? Jesus Christ that night said, without me, you can do? I had a sermon on that last week in Iowa. And man, it rung in my ears. And you know what? I discovered that if you can memorize half a verse, that's a big help. Without you, I can do nothing. He said, you need me, the Holy Spirit, to live the Christian life. You need me to understand the Bible. Book of Romans says, 
You need the Holy Spirit to help you know how to pray? Book of Ephesians says you need to be filled with the Spirit to be a decent husband, wife, obedient kid. Without me, I can't be a family member. Without, without you, Lord, I can't obey my parents. I can't, I can't. That's what the word was. He said, except you abide in the vine, you cannot bear fruit. Can't. And you know what? People are either on the side of can't Christianity or can. You know, I can't get over my temper. I can't clean up my mouth. I can't witness. I can't understand the Bible. I can't be the kind of husband my wife wants me to be. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. You know, that's a pretty lousy place to be. Or you could be over here. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, but without him I can do and you know what you go through the day? Lord, without you, I can't drive to work. Without you, I can't be a good employee. Without you, I can't say the right thing to my kid when he comes home. Without you, I can't clean the house. Without you, I can't cook the meal. And you know what? That's abiding me, constantly depending. I'm going to need your help. And then constantly submitting. He explained it in verse 10 this way. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In verse 9, he says, the Father loves me. In verse 10, he says, in response to his love, I submit to him 24-7. And when he was on the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ was heard to say, I am here not to do my will, but my Father's will. He would say these words, they are not my words, they're my Father's words. If any preacher ever had a right to take credit for his own ministry, it was Jesus Christ. But he never did. These works, they're not my works, they're his works. And you know what? He was constantly submitted to his Father. And you know what, Pastor? If I get to the place where the will of God is not just an important part of my life, it is my life. Where it's get up the morning and say, what would you like done today, Lord? Now that has to go with dependence. Because you're going to have to say, now Lord, I'll do whatever. Matter of fact, another verse in the chapter says, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. Whatever, whatever. Whatever, whatever. Whatever. What's in the Bible? If it, I read it, I'll do it. Whatever your spirit tells me to do, what phone call I should make, what turn I should make driving down the road, whatever, Lord, whatever. But I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help. That's abiding in me. It's a way of life, a way of life. Where I'm saying, dear Lord, you know how frail and weak and how prone to failure I am. But dear Lord, if I'm alive today, I'm going to abide in you. And that means I'm going to cling to you. I need you. I need you for help, for everything. But also my whole day is doing what you want me to do. And you know what happens? When you're in that condition, God will use you. There's a guy named Alex. He's probably pushing 30 now. And uh, <clears throat> when I first went to his church, I barely noticed him. He was probably you know, down closer to young 20s. But I went back, they had me back a couple years. We had a measure of revival several times at that church. And Alex was moving on and he was understanding better. Understanding what? <laughs> Abide in me. You say, put in a nutshell, what is revival? Abide in me, that's it. A, a life of union with Jesus Christ. Where, whatever, Lord, whatever, 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 I love you. Whatever. But you're going to have to help me. Bide in me, that's it. And you know what? Alex was getting it. I would go back the next year. And he finally seemed to get it. And you might say, what do you mean get it? I'm not talking about intelligence. I don't mean he was smarter than you. I'm not talking about knowing it. 
I'm talking about believing it. And I remember the week I was there, where it was going to be eight days, and then second Sunday we were going to try to bring lost souls and get them saved. Incidentally, that Sunday we saw a bunch of people get saved, and the pastor baptized six people. Doesn't happen everywhere for me. I'm not saying it's me. And this was in a very hard city. But Alex, that week, he got it. And I can't read somebody's heart, but he seemed to be abiding in Christ. Every night you would see him. Well, in my prayer time, it seemed like the Lord spoke to me and said, you know what, you ought to do some soul winning here, and I always try everywhere I go. Ask Alex. So I saw Alex, I think Thursday, and I said, you know, I want to do some soul winning tomorrow, Friday. And I said, or maybe it was Saturday, I don't remember which. And I said, you know what, I think I want to ask you, would you have any time? And he said, that's really interesting, you should ask me, I'm off work. And I was thinking about asking if I could go with you. I said, well, then it's a deal. We'll go somewhere and try to witness to somebody. But then he said, but I got a funeral to go to tomorrow morning. Somebody died that I know, and I'm going to be there for him and his family. And I said, I'd like to go to a funeral. You know, I'm a minister. I, I would like to go with you. We could go to the funeral. So we went to the funeral together and uh, waited, and afterwards we were going to go to soul money. We went to the gravesite, and we came back because they were going to have a meal. And we thought, you know what? We might be able to talk to somebody about eternity at the funeral meal. So we were in there, and then we split up. We didn't go eat, but we, we split up. Alex went that way. I went this way in the lobby. There were a couple hundred people there. And I'll tell you how things work for me. I would go up to someone. They were looking at the lady's picture. Young lady died young. And I said, you know what? The most interesting thing to me about her story that the pastor told was her relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you know about that? You know what they did? Turned around and walked away from me. So let's just say I wasn't seeing a lot of success. <laughs> and I went to another person and they walked away and all this. Then I watched Alex. Alex was going around and then there he was at the front door and a young lady was walking in for some reason. He was there at the door and he gave her a tract out of the tract rack. And I watched him, and she was listening to him. And he was talking to her. And I was praying for him. And in just a few minutes, she bowed her head right there in public and prayed. So give me a minute. And I went up to them. I said, hi, Alex. He said, I want you to meet somebody. This is so-and-so. She just received Jesus Christ. I thought I could help her in some way. So I said, now, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, I go to this one. It's been my second week. And you know what? Every week I have thought, I need to get saved. But I just didn't have the courage to go forward. And then Alex met me right here at the door. And I met Jesus Christ. I said, come here. I had met the pastor, and I introduced her to the pastor. Something happened. You want to know why? Alex started abiding the condition of the soul winner. Now, help me with this. How many of you would say, I would agree, that if anything happens when a sinner meets a saint, it has to do with the condition of the Christian? Raise your hand. Of course. Number two, the choices of the sinner. I won't go to the verses. But did you know the Bible teaches that every sinner you ever met has already had contact with Jesus Christ? In the first chapter of John, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then it says, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Did you know that everyone in the world gets a visit from Jesus Christ? I don't know just when. They are born sinners, in a way born in darkness. But listen, friend, not in utter darkness. And something called light comes to them. An awareness of God, although they may not know it's God. An awareness of right and wrong. 
And that's the direct witness of Jesus Christ to everyone born in Mongolia, South America, Canada, USA. Everyone in the world has already been contacted by Jesus Christ. And they make choices. In Proverbs chapter 1, it's put this way. God's wisdom is crying out in the streets, calling young men to herself. She is saying, I am wisdom. Forsake folly. Do not be simple. If you come to me, I'll pour out my spirit to you. And then chapter 1 says this. She says to some of them, you are going to face terrible consequences because you chose not the fear of the Lord. Now when someone hears the voice of God's wisdom or sees the light of Christ in their young years, they have a choice. Some of them cho choose to fear the Lord. Some of them say, I need that. I don't know what that feeling is, but that's where I need to be. I'm not there. And some people do this. Some people say, turn that light off. Turn that, would you tell that lady to shut up? I don't want to hear that. I'm writing my own agenda. They do. When we go to John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And before I ever met the sinner or he ever met me, he's already made some choices. Oh, yes, he has. Some of them, you wonder why some are so irritated, why it's so much deeper than the surface. It's because maybe from when they were four or 14, they've been saying, turn that light off. Man, get me out of here. No way. Shut her. Tell that lady to shut up. That's what they've been doing. And you know what? Thank God they can repent. There are people in this room who turned their back on the light, hated the light for a while. Then after a while, I don't know why, you wise stuff. And I'm not talking about when you got saved. I'm talking about prior to your salvation. You started saying, there must be something more to life than what I've got. And you know what? The choices of a sinner makes a difference as to what kind of a meeting that will be when he bumps in to the saint. Then, of course, he gets the final choice, believe or not. The third element is the communication of Scripture, the New Testament Scripture. You know what it does? Glorifies Jesus. I remember you've had this. I remember, I'm thinking of one guy, but there was more than one, door to door out in the country. Hello, my name is Rick Flanders, this is Joe Blow. We're from the Junietta Baptist Church. We're just making visits down here on Murphy Lake Road, and the guy just stared at me. I said, now, we have some literature we'd like to give out and see if we could talk to you, and he just looked at me and he said, could you come in? I said, sure we could. We went in and sat down, and he told us his story. And then he said this, and I'd have to tell you the whole thing, but he said, I was just sitting there wondering if there were still churches that sent people door to door. And I was thinking, nobody does that anymore. What I would give if some Christian would come to that door and then knock, 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 and it's Flanders. And I'm telling you, friends, there are sinners out there for whom the greatest thing that could ever happen to them would be to meet you with the scriptures because the scriptures glorify Jesus Christ and a sinner who realizes his need from the scriptures can see he's the one I need. And you know what that ought to happen? That ought to happen this week. That ought to happen this week. Did you know that God himself is not standing aloof in outer space 
with no concern for all the heartache and misery and disappointment and depression there is in the world today. He is not standing aloof. Did you know that God himself solved every human problem when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again? And did you know his spirit is sufficient to tell the message of his love to every last person on the face of the earth, but it's going to be through you and through me. Brother Don, you know, he's infirm. He was in the hospital. I don't know what happened in the hospital, but did you know anywhere God sends you, you can be a witness? How many would say I know? If you went to the poorhouse, if you got evicted, if the worst thing imaginable happened to you, if you were abiding in Jesus Christ, you'd have peace. And not only that, God would use you. But you know what we have to do? We have to get in the condition. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Thanks for listening so long. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching us about the highest form of life, a believer abiding in Christ, the reprover becoming the comforter, Oh, Lord, make us your channel. Lord, get us ready. While our heads bowed, let me ask you, where are you along this progression? Where are you? Are you in darkness but aware of the light? Are you unsaved? But as I spoke, as we thought about ways in which God has made himself known to you, you would say, "Ah, that's happened to me. In darkness, but aware of the light. Is that you? Where are you? Are you still an unbeliever, but you're ready to believe? He has drawn you. You are ready to make tonight the night. Where are you? Are you a believer? The reprover who got you ready to get saved has become the comforter at the moment you receive Jesus Christ. Is that where you are? Let me go further. Are you a saint but not abiding? A believer but not walking with Christ? A Christian but not in a condition where God would use you in anybody's life? Or are you an abiding Christian seeing God use you? Who would say, Mr. Flanders, I'm an unsaved person, but I am aware of the light. Pray for me. And I'll pray that God will give you more light so that you voluntarily will come. But will you let me do that? Who would say, Mr. Flanders, I'm still in the darkness, but I'm aware of the light, and I'll let you pray for me. Raise your hand. Who would say to me, Brother Flanders, I'm not perfect, and I often fail, but as I sit here and you stand there, I think I can be honest to say I am a believer, and I am abiding in Christ. Right now, I'm living in dependence, and submission to Jesus Christ. Whatever he wants, I will do if he helps me do it. That's why I am right now, and I expect to see fruit. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Holding it up, no boast, no one's looking but me. Hands down. Who would say, Brother Flanders, I'm a saint, and I'm in the world to be a witness for Christ, but it's not working for me. I can I can't say Right now, I'm abiding. No. But I know how to confess my sins, and I know how to dedicate my life, and if the Lord will help me, that's what I'm going to do tonight. Would you raise your hand? And take it down. Who else? Who else will say, Preacher, I'm a witness, but I'm out of commission as it is at this moment, pray for me. Raise your hand. I saw your hand. Who else? 
Why don't we gather to the altar? Thank you right back there. I'm not going to move on. Who else? Who else? Responding to the truth tonight will say, I need to start abiding in Jesus Christ. That's not where I live. But I'll let you pray for me. Who else? Yes. Yes. Thank God for you. Every light is very important. Every light. Who else? Dear Lord, we're asking you to have your way right now, not just for the invitation or for the service, not even for this week, but Lord, for the future. Down the road, Lord, put us in a new way of living. May we get our hearts clean with you by confession, and then may we start living a life of dependence and submission to you. Help believers to start abiding, especially the ones who ask me to pray for them. And I am praying for them. Let a whole new chapter start tonight. Make us fruitful branches starting now. Shall we stand? We'll stand together with our heads bowed. I'm going to ask for her to find that song, Channels Only, that we sang earlier. And then I'm going to ask you to do this. Why don't we gather at the front? Those of you deciding to abide in Christ, coming clean. He says, now you're clean, abide in me. If that's what you're going to do, stepping out to be an effective witness for Christ, well, then you come right to the front. Find a place to pray. If you want to say a word to the preacher, do so. But come on down and let's prepare for a night and a day and a week of fruitful witness. Let's make it so it's different when the next sinner meets this saint. Can we do that? All right, she starts to play. And if you want to come, you come right now. Come on. The place you live, the place you work, the place you go to school is a dark place. And there's a need for a light. You are that light. Ye are the light of the world, Jesus said. Put your light up on a candlestick. Let him work through you. Get full of God. Then go out into that dark world and let God use you. Wherever, whatever, Lord. She'll play a little bit more. 